have been instrumental and helpful over the years. Um, you know who you are, um, Steve, Andy, John, uh, it's uh, Jim. Uh, thank you for your support and your encouragement. And uh, and if I've missed your name, don't worry about it. Uh, it's it's uh, appreciated. Uh, you're always uh, close to me in uh, many ways as far as those things that I do. So uh, while examining past events, historical narrative is often relegated to a series of well-known events that portray a saga. But sometimes it is, as in this case, the unearthing of some all but forgotten details many which are obscured by a more prominent event occurring, that the particulars of their achievements cast a new light on the historical narrative. Today's presentation is based on seven years of research by Terry Finnegan, Helmut Jaeger, and myself, and is the fundamental aspect of our first book in a four volume set Shooting the Front, Eastern Operations, Military Aviation on the Eastern Front, Evolution of a Critical Role of Modern Warfare. So, What is commonly known as the Battle of Tannenberg is actually uh, a series of battles that occurred uh, prior to the main battle. Uh, but uh, the focus of this talk is really the main battle, though aspects of what happened prior and after will be uh, just uh, touched upon. So, the hard statistics, uh, the number of engaged, uh, the Russian Second Army, the Russian First Army, a combined strength of 230,000 men, the German Eighth Army, a strength of 150,000. Uh, the Russian commanders in the field, uh, General Alta Cavalry uh, running camp, uh, First Army commander, uh, the Nyman Army, so named because of <clears throat> the Nyman, and uh, General of the Cavalry, uh, Samsonov, uh, Second Army commander, uh, the Narav Army. It, it is his <clears throat> experience that we'll be looking at. So prior to the opening salvos of the war, Russia, with its alliance with France, was committed to attack Germany. And moving forward with its planned attack against Germany before it was prepared would ultimately cost the Russians 300,000 casualties. The Russian strategy was based on a pincer movement with two army groups invading East Prussia. Uh, the Russian first army commander, as I said, ran and camp from his army group, which aimed straight at the heart of Prussia from the east. The Russian second army, which prior to the outbreak of war had been intended to be a reserve formation to be held back until reinforcements against either Germany or Austria was required, moved northward from Warsaw under General Samsonov. This army group aimed to cut off the eight armies line of retreat. The two armies were directed by General Zelensky, who set up his headquarters in Belarus, about 250 miles from Kronosberg. Initially, both the first and second Russian armies overwhelmed the German positions in East Prussia, which is not surprising given the strength of men in the field. And you can see the composition of the Russian 
first and second armies uh, down to division strength and regiment and brigade. It was quite large. As I said, <clears throat> since we're focusing on the main battle, uh, I'm identifying the commanders and leaders of uh, Hindenburg, Mudendorf, and Hoffman as the Army uh, Deputy Chief of Staff. Uh, and prior to that, uh, it was uh, Britwitz, and we'll, we'll discuss more about him as the talk goes forward. and the composition of the uh, German 8th Army Group. Russian casualties and losses, 78,000 killed or wounded, 92,000 POWs, 10,000 escaped. German casualties and losses, 10,000 to 15,000 killed or wounded, uh, not counting how many were POWs. Field Marshal <clears throat> Edmund Ironside saw Tannenberg as the greatest defeat suffered by any of the combatants during the war. It was a tactical masterpiece that demonstrated the superior skills of the German army. Their pre-war organization and training had proven themselves, which boasted German morale while severely shaking Russian confidence. That's his viewpoint. I would like to say there is a distinction to be made between the failure of the Russian army and the success of the German army. This will be a little lengthy, but I need to set the stage. The Russian lack of logistics, lines of supply and communication soon will become more than the army in the field could support and continued advance. This was due in part to the hasty mobilization of troops and resources for war. The rapid deployment with poor means of transport for men and material would quickly take its toll. Two of the major difficulties lay in the difference of the rail lines and lack of roads. The Russians could not operate their locomotives beyond the national border with Germany and could only depend on captured locomotives and rolling stock, thus greatly diminishing the ability to advance other than by the use of roads and by foot. The lack of usable roads in Russia to carry the supplies in enough quantity to support the advance across to East Prussia would greatly diminish the large supply of much needed men and material. Although the initial phase of the Russian invasion into Germany was carried forth by sheer weight of numbers, there was far more extemporization than the Russian army would be capable of sustaining. The Russian army in many ways was a reflection of Russian society as a whole. It was nothing less than the last vestiges of a feudalistic society. Illiteracy was rampant. The officer corps was from an elite of society and the enlisted, though dedicated, were better suited for a Napoleonic conflict than a full out technological sophisticated war, which was all too quickly evident. The experiences of the Russo-Japanese war nine years earlier with the destructive elements of machine guns, hand grenades, mortars, though thoroughly understood by the Russian military high command, seems not to have made enough of an impact on their planning and carrying forth of their initial campaign. Communications was a daunting challenge that would have dire consequences for the Russians. Whereas the Germans had the use of their national telegraph and telephone system, as well as wireless, the Russians would have to depend on what they brought. The Russian supply of cable was insufficient to run telephones or telegraph connections from the rear for the two army groups, all they had or already needed for field communications. 
Therefore, they relied on mobile wireless stations, which would link Zelensky to his army, to army commanders, as well as with corps commanders. Both Russian army groups were short of experienced wireless telegraph operators. The Russians were short of the newer code books. Zelensky and Remkamp each had one, and disastrously, Samsonov's group did not. Hence, many messages were sent in the clear, with nothing more than a hope and a prayer they would not be intercepted, which in fact they were. Due to the combination of poor strategic planning, coordination between army commanders, logistical support, secure, secure communications, battlefield situational awareness, intelligence, and aerial reconnaissance, the Russian invasion of East Prussia was all a doom. German strategy regarding Russia was based on a defensive tool model. The analysis indicated the Russian railway network, the only means of the only means of deploying a large military force, limited the Russians to three options: a purely defensive posture against Germany, an offensive down the Vistula straight towards Berlin an invasion of East Prussia with two armies, one from the Narrow River area and in the south, and one from the Nyman River in the east. French political pressure would obviate the first option, while the second possibility would prove to be militarily untenable, leaving the third option as the most likely Russian course of action. Alfred von Schwarzen in 1894 War gained a scenario that corresponded to the Battle of Tannenberg in 1914. It envisioned the Russian Nyman army having overrun half of East Prussia. The German commander in the exercise exploited the separation between the Russian Narav and Nyman armies to mass his troops against the right flank of the Narav army and destroy the whole force. In the exercise critique, Schlieffen said the Germans could easily just establish a defensive line behind the Vistula. But when the opportunity to destroy an entire Russian army was available, it should be taken. Schlieffen foresaw a mobile operation on interior lines using railways to mass forces against one Russian army and destroying it before it could retreat. As a result, every German general staff officer in East Prussia in 1914 already had a model on how to respond to the August 1914 Russian offensive. The German Schleifen plan had employed in 1914 projected the defeat of France while the Russians were still mobilizing. The plan envisioned German armies would then shift by train to the Eastern Front to deal with the Russian invasion. A single army was garrisoned in East Prussia, the Eighth Army, commanded initially by General Maximilian von Frittwitz, which was to hold back the Russians while outcome in the West was decided. Additionally, the natural barriers, a series of lakes and marshes and dense woods that characterized the province would help the German defenders as it would limit the areas of approach by the Russians. When the war began, the bulk of the German Eighth Army was southwest of Konigsberg, ready to defend either the western or south southern frontier. The German high command replaced Pritzwitz and chose Generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff to confront the Russian invasion forces. They were familiar with the Schleifen plan to realize the opportunity to defend and defeat the Russian threat was within reach. By screening the Russian First Army with mobile cavalry force and redirecting the rest of the troops via German train transport to the south, the plan which they carried out was to en en envelop the unsuspecting Russian Second Army and destroy it. And then they would redirect their forces against the Russian First Army. So we have the outline of what was to come. But our focus is on aviation. So to put it in context, we need to just do a quick glimpse of 
aviation in pre-war Russia and pre-war Germany to have a better understanding of what was going to happen technologically and tactically. The Russo-Japanese War 1904-1905 used the already established aeronautical units of the Imperial Russian Army. They were active in the field, providing aerial reconnaissance and artillery spotting. The ballonet you see on the left is for field filling of the observation balloon on the right. It is not, as many people have suspected, a balloon. As with the rest of Europe, European continent, Russians were quite air-minded. Grand Duke Alexander Mikhailovich was a proponent of both military air fleet and civilian-based industry. Numerous military and civil competitions, events, and expositions were carried out between 1909 and 1914. One such is here in the picture. The Russian Military Aeronautical Department of the main engineering director established the first nearly simultaneous schools for pilots, one in St. Petersburg at Gatchina and the other at Sevastopol. So flying could occur, occur year round, both for army and Navy pilots. And this is uh, an image of the Sevastopol in 1911. A wide variety of firing designs were employed, many built under license, but all requiring foreign manufactured engines, which would portend the problems to later be encountered by the Russians during the war. And this is military training in 1911, and you see Russian naval and army pilots uh, working together, uh, both for uh, training and exercise. And there was no differentiation at this point. And that's a Blario. There was a robust indigenous design and emerging manufacturing industry in Russia. The most prolific was Igor Isokorsky, who began independently and then became chief designer and engineer at the Russo Baltic Wagon Works, RBBZ. And this is the Sikorsky S6 in 1911. Uh, a very successful design, which got him hired by the firm. In 1913, Sikorsky, working at the RBBZ, designed the Ruski Vatyas, also known as the Grand. It was the world's first multi-engine enclosed cabin aircraft and the progenitor for more ambitious designs. Military maneuvers included aircraft and the use of them in coordination with field forces for reconnaissance and the integration with core units was beginning to develop. Unfortunately, this occurred with more junior officers than with the high command. So a disparity of what could and should be done occurred and was never resolved fully by 1914. In 1913, Stab's captain Viktor Rodzinich Poplavko made 19 flights with a maximum machine gun on a Farman. This first experimental flight revealed a machine gun could be operated from an airplane, but the spent cartridges needed to be safely contained to avoid hitting the engine. In March 1914, Stab Captain Popolovko and Porochik Alex uh, Pankratiev flew in a Farman uh, 15 and shot at tethered balloons in various altitudes. These trials included the firing of the dummy at dummy troop targets on the ground to judge the effectiveness of ground strafing from an aircraft. Uh, this is the later design. Uh, the Maxim gun has the um, cartridge belt and a spent cartridge uh, container built in. Uh, you see that rectangular device 
midway on the gun. The development of nearly 30 Kopozny Aviatry Outrad, KAO, or Core Aviation Detachments, together with the uh, Fortress Aviation Detachments, were the foundational aspects of the Imperial Russian Air Fleet in 1914. Uh, these are new ports, which was part of the mainstay at this point, uh, the Russian air fleet. In 1914, the RBVZ, following Sikorsky's vision of a large transport aircraft, undertook the construction of the Ilya Monomets after successful flights of the first one. A second variant was construction and flown on the eve of the Great War. Sikorsky and a crew of four undertook this, his well-known historic round trip flight from St. Petersburg to Kiev, uh, providing, proving the efficacy of long range flight. This becomes important in Russia. From the time of the Wright brothers, in 1909 tour and the demonstration flights in Europe of, to 1914, uh, Germany's aviation endeavors were unsurpassed. For not only was there an emerging and robust industry in development, but many foundational aspects of the aeronautical sciences had found home in the university. Additionally, Germany already had developed a successful rigid airship capable of immense possibilities for air transport. Perhaps one of the more familiar silhouettes in the sky was the bird-shaped Taub airplane designed by Igo Eitrich of Austria-Hungary in 1910, a design inspired by the unique shape of a climbing vine, uh, vine whose seed, uh, Austromitra Markop, I'm not gonna remember that, uh, that could loft on the wind in a seemingly long and steady glide. Uh, due to the lack of license fees, 14 companies built a number of variations of the initial design. It's quite an elegant. This stable and reliable airplane would in some ways become the foundation for a number of constructors and firms to come into existence with their own successful designs. Um, in this case, we're looking at Rumpla. Uh, why biplanes? A simplified explanation. The structure and lift properties with the power to weight ratio of the inline engine were proportionally better than the monoplane uh, using the same engine at the time. Comparison uh, of the different models and designs. So we can see here they're pretty comparable, except that when we're dealing with climb performance, there is a a marked difference, and the same with flying characteristics. Uh, better. Uh, aerodynamics on the biplane at the time to the uh, rudimentary Taub design, which <clears throat> so I referred to it as the Imperial Russian Air Fleet. It's not the Imperial Russian Air Service, it's not the Russian Air service, it's, it's the Imperial Russian Air Fleet. And Russian aviation did take part in the invasion of East Prussia. 
it is known that only a small number of aircraft were successfully deployed, a total of 38, but not all of them making it to the front. So as you can see, these are the various core units and how many aircraft they had assigned initially, um, but that quickly diminished with infield problems of both uh, bad landings, uh, lack of engine maintenance, and um, a variety of other uh, incidentals. There were no air parks, but I will touch on this. So this was with the first army. With the second army, with Samsonov, So as you can see, so this is an interesting uh, illustration, map illustration that was made after the war by one of the participants in the first army of the reconnaissance flight that was made from uh, the, uh, across the Nyman to, uh, towards uh, uh, Konigsberg. Um, Let me go back to this. The problems encountered by the five KO squadrons reflected general state of the affair. Transport of the machines to the front were fraught with difficulties, and once on station, only a few of the aircraft were able to get into the air. This was due in part to the nature of the aircraft, which required maintenance supplies that were not readily available. Even so, Aero reconnaissance reports were received with skepticism, distrust, and all what but ignored. This was due to a combination of factors. The means of communication as well as coordination between the aviation section and the commanders in the field were not properly established prior to the deployment, which I had indicated earlier. It was mostly the mid-level officer corps that had that, but not the high command. Familiarity and understanding of aero reconnaissance under wartime conditions had not yet developed within the Russian military command. Another critical factor that came into play was the elapsed period of time between the reconnaissance and the communique to the commanders, which took far longer than deemed useful, and many of the reports were not considered a viable intelligence resource. Due to the improvisational nature of the deployment, the organizational arrangements for aero reconnaissance reporting was not coordinated, and thus any useful information that the crews had ascertained from their flights were not presented in a coordinated manner. Uh, this is a case of one of the few archival uh, documents where uh, we have Poplavko again uh, and his uh, uh, observer uh, officer of the Tosky, uh, and there's a whole report that goes with this, uh, with the drawings, because they weren't using cameras at the time. Uh, there were fortifications, with the, as you can see, uh, and this was part, uh, this is in, contained, this original drawing is contained in the uh, Russian archives, uh, showing that. Uh, the type of uh, communications that were transferred between uh, officers in the field and the command. So just a quick uh, look at some of the aircraft and uh, that it's unique because we do have pictures of Russian aircraft in the field uh, in Prussia from uh, 1914. And uh, this is the first KO on the Farm in 16. Uh, the officer on the left is uh, Stabs Captain Prusis, who's the commander of the first KO, who also flew with Sikorsky on that epic flight from St. Petersburg to Kiev and back. Uh, 
the 15th KO in the field of East Prussia figured prominently, and they made a number of reconnaissance flights. Uh, in their group, uh, they uh, had a, a photographer who's also a pilot, Anoshenko, and there's a series of photographs that still exist of the operation of the 15th KL in the field in East Prussia. Uh, 15th K in the field of East Prussia with a new port for, for uh, prepared for field transport, as you can see. Uh, it's, uh, and interestingly, in the 21st KAO uh, was SUS Lieutenant Alphonse Flavian uh, Louis Poiré, who stayed with the Imperial Russian Air Fleet throughout the war. Uh, and here he is with a foreman. He was well known and he flew in um, the East Prussia campaign as well. After Generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff had assumed command of the Eight Army, they had entered the road of high risk concept of operations. The success was completely dependent upon early and exhaustive knowledge of the opponent's intent and actions. Air reconnaissance for the first time in the war offered the opportunity to gain such comprehensive overview of the enemy actions. Unlike the Russians, the German mechanism for air reconnaissance reporting was coordinated. The question whether air reconnaissance had a crucial role can only be answered with yes. Before the fighting began, German air reconnaissance detected both Russian armies and provided this essential intelligence to German commanders for their planning and disposition of the operations against the invading Russian army. Both the leaders of the Eight Army and Corps commanding generals knew that the high-risk plan of attacking two Russian armies, one after the other, could only succeed is if intelligence and reconnaissance provided up to date uh, with the enemy situation. And as you can see, they had quite a number of units fielded, uh, including uh, Zeppelins and uh, a, a Drachen balloon unit from Königsberg. One of the mainstay air planes in use at the time uh, was the Talba, and there were a number of different manufacturing ones, uh, including the German Talba, uh, Albatross, and LVG. Two Zeppelin airships accompanied only a few long range nighttime reconnaissance and bombing missions. The Zeppelin did not move up to the high pre-war expectations because of their high vulnerability, their extreme dependence on suitable weather. They soon proved not fit for this form of modern warfare. The early loss of Z5 taught the German high ranking military establishment the lesson that their pre war enthusiasm for airborne giants did not stand, to the stand up to the reality of war. Airships as reconnaissance platforms were doomed, airplanes ascended, and what notably had expected, captive balloons saw a rebirth. Feldluftschiff Abdelong 8 experienced the first successful employment of a Drachen balloon with the first reserve corps. Although the captive balloon's lack of flexibility and deep penetration capabilities of airplanes, they served well for direct observation of enemy artillery positions and tactical moves on the battlefield. performance of the air units from the 24th to the 31st of August. The total number of sorties was 120 plus or minus. 
uh, losses by enemy action were zero. The average sortie uh, was about 15 per day. The German 8th Army and each of the Army Corps had Feldflieger Abteilung FFA with six airplane and 68 air crew pilots and observers. Uh, the Fustenflieger Abteilung Fest FA at the Fortress Konigsberg, Grodens, Lodens, had only two to four airplanes per unit and thus fewer air crews. The operational air units were backed by the rear air parks. Loaded, located at Dershau, south of Danzig, which provided logistical support and replacements. The employment of air resources before and in the battle show how rapidly the general commanders and their general staff had learned the lessons of the new weapon. During preparatory periods of operational moves and, the moves and the concepts, air reconnaissance was used as a means of choice to clarify the enemy intentions by monitoring the big moves. Sometimes radio intercepts first gave indications, aerial observations ascertained or discarded the findings. When the battle came, air observers had to see what was happening on the battlefield and report with only little delay to their commanders. But two factors made themselves felt, um, nighttime and weather. The eight army command issued specific reconnaissance tasks to the daily army operations order, leaving the corps commander with enough resources for their own corps reconnaissance tasking. Targets only were specified. Mission executions left to the air unit commands and their air crews. During the preparatory periods of the battle, the targets were the majority, the major enemy units and their movements or assemblies, including size and composition. The results allowed for the inference of enemy assaults and impending action. When it came to battle, the Corps commanders were focusing on battlefield reconnaissance, while the Army command wanted to see whether reinforcements were approaching. The intensity of air action can best be illustrated by the performance statistics of all eight Army air units. Average sortie generation, as I stated, was rate of 15 days for 15 per day for the whole aid army translates to around 15 daily mission reports to keep the enemy situation updated. The reconnaissance missions flown at altitudes from 800 to 1800 meters. The average mission duration was two to three hours. Air crews performed hitherto unbelievably well, and they often flew in spite of poor visibility and low cloud conditions. Russian airplanes were rarely seen. The highest danger was small arms fire, certainly not only from the enemy, often also from their own ground troops. Anti-air artillery had not yet been fielded. Only huge airships were prone to Russian artillery fire. Normally, crews reported after landing. In urgent situations, observers dropped messages over their troops or even landed in proximity of the command post to report directly to the general commanders, other general staff officers, orally and on message pads. Almost at the same time, the reports were distributed to all commanders concerned using the most expeditious means of communication. Such practices were sometimes impossible to execute for lack of land telephone lines or simply because vital information got stuck by operators' misinterpretations or because of non-existent connection. Because of the rapid moves of the Army Corps and divisions, communications were sometimes lost. On rare occasions, airplanes served for message and exchange and also to reestablish contact between command posts. This was only the, an exceptional case. The communication services on both sides of the combatants were poor and 
inadequate control of the giant masses of troops. The Germans, however, were better off in East Prussia because they could use their homeland line telephones and telegraph network. In the Russian occupied areas of East Prussia, German cavalry and remaining German civilians frequently cut the wires in order to prevent enemy use of telephone or telegraph. The typical Feldflieger Appelung was flexible and followed the moves of its parent formation. Airplanes could land and take off from dry and flat grounds with only some 100 meter freedom of obstacles in the takeoff or landing path. Importantly, they needed ground logistics, for instance, the supply of aircraft specific consumables and technical support. A Feldflieger Appelung had a ground staff of around 120 men for all aspects of maintenance and repair. When a unit was transferred, the air crews would fly to the new location. Were not possible, ground transport of dismounted airplanes was executed. The ground staff included airplane shelter tents and all the equipment and materials for first line technical and logistical support were transported on trucks. I want to break here and talk about signal intelligence. And uh, thank you, Andy. We saw often pointed out that German commanders had the big advantage of listening in to Russian radio intercepts. However, in the opening weeks of the war on the Eastern Front, the majority of decisions were independent of radio intercepts. Substance. Still, the question of whether aviation or radio intercepts were more important is sometimes posed even nowadays. The answer is not clear. An answer can be found when the facts about radio intercepts are looked upon at this early stage of the war, especially during the short period of the Tannenberg battle from the 25th to the 30th of August. It is true that two radio intercepts may substantiate the importance of the decisions of General Hindenburg to dare attacking the Southern Russian Second Army with all his consolidated forces and leaving the Northern East Prussia undefended. These two Russian command methods intercepted in the night of 25th, 25th of August confirmed the German eight army leaders that their enemy was unaware of their daring intent and that the Russian first army general commander Renenka made no move to come south in support of their threatened comrade in arms General Samsonov. In judging the real value, it should be considered that the German aid army had a host of mainly air reconnaissance reports that indicated the Russian first army slowly and strictly Western advance on Konigsberg without any concern with the situation in the South. General Hindenburg's decision for the Southern high-risk operation was based on the exhaustive situation analysis and evaluation primarily gained by air reconnaissance, as well as the commun wireless communiques. The above mentioned radio intercepts acknowledged the already existing situation assessment. They supported what was already observed before and during the battle. A host of reports, many random from, ran many random from radio intercepts came in, but it was air reconnaissance that gave the German commanders throughout the campaign, the decisive edge. There's a fundamental difference between aerial intelligence and communications intelligence. Air reconnaissance yields a steady flow of intelligence because of its active employment method mode. Air reconnaissance missions were actively tasked, i.e. the commanders to find which information they needed at any given time from what areas of interest. Radio intercepts, in contrast, were passive sources and additionally dependent on enemy operators' carelessness. And it should be kept in mind that at the early stages of communications intelligence, only sporadic results could be expected. As a well known example of aerial reconnaissance, that matter occurred on August 30th. 
It was believed Russian I First Corps had been beaten. Nonetheless, it was redirected to take Nidenberg in order to break the southern enclosure of the German containment. German pilot Lieutenant Kentner and observer Lieutenant Martin, Mertens from FFA 14, who had taken off at 6 a.m., followed their ordered mission route, flying low at 1,100 meters because of haze, and detected a Russian troop assembly of substantial strength in the woods along the road from Walla to Nidenberg. Columns directed on Nidenberg had already begun to march. Lieutenant Mertens dropped bombs on the disembarking troops at Mawa Station. The crew judged their findings so important that they tried to land close to General Francois's command post. However, they found the landing site already being shelled by enemy artillery. They turned back to Gregersdorf and landed close to the German battalion there. The adjutant officer was immediately informed and the flyers then hurried on bicycles to Nidenberg. En route, they luckily caught a passing motor car. They arrived at Nidenberg and alarmed General Francois at about 8.30 a.m. about the imminent Russian attack. The report at first was doubted upon because there had been no other indications of the threat. Their report was confirmed at 9.10 by Lieutenant Kerner and Hess, also from FFA, FFA 14, and a report dropped at Nidenberg Town Square. Kantner and Mertens hurried back to the town, took off, and flew directly to Army headquarters. There, they were immediately brought before General Ludendorff, where they confirmed the report dropped on Nidenberg Town Square by Kerner and Hess. In response, General Hindenburg ordered Kent and Merton to drop detailed reports on respective unit command posts. Unfortunately, the Taub was unable to take off. Quickly returning to their airfield by automobile, they had another air crew carry out the messenger service. The German army's response to the Russian attack effectively blunted the Russian relief operation and they withdrew the next day. The eventual encirclement of the Russian Second Army and the capture of many of its officers and, and its men is well documented. Members of the 15th KAO, this is this image here we have up, with a Newport 4 fuselage on transport wagon during the retreat from East Prussia in August 1914. The wings are prominently absent from the wagon, standing that they, they would be assembled alongside with the fuselage during conveyance, as we had seen. The Roman numerals on the fuselage indicate it's from the 15th KAL. This uh, well-known photograph of captured Russian aircraft and parts uh, up front, we can see a monosopop, a nine cylinder type B, uh, Imperial Russian Air Fleet flag in the lower left corner. That's not a Union Jack, that's the Russian Naval Ensign uh, because it's the Air Fleet, uh, Newport, four parts and spares. And the personnel holding the flag is a German from the German medical unit. It is appropriate that Hindenburg crave, did, gave credence with his definitive utterance of crediting aviation accomplishments on Flieger kein Tannenberg without flyers, no Tannenberg. The initial operations of the German eight army forces in East Prussia in August 1914 proved the decisive role of the airplane. The air service provided the ground commanders with eyes of the army. General Oberst von Hindenburg, thanks to the excellent results of the air service supported by intelligence from intercepts of the Russian command, radio traffic was always well informed about the adversary. 
The flyers earn particular merit by their reports about the Russian relief attempts at the end of the battle. The flyers gave the German eight army generals confidence that the Russian general Rennenkamp and his first army maintained, remained passive and did not relieve General Samson on his dying second army. Both Russian army field armies apparently did not and could not make use of their air resources. The resupply of aircraft and maintenance was limited to what was brought with the KAOs. Russian air units were mostly employed for messenger service. A operationally important reconnaissance was not employed by the Russian generals to strong effect. The Masurian Lakes, well, that's another interesting story for another time. Uh, Helmut Jaeger on the left, Terry Finnegan on the right, and yours truly in the middle. Thank you, Carl. Uh, that's Carl Bobrow of the National Air and Space Museum. And thanks so much. This, this is not an area of expertise for me, and I know I personally learned learned a lot. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Um, this is Melanie, the administrative assistant for the World War One Association, with today's speaker, Carl Bobrow, and we are going to open it up to a Q and A. We do have a large crowd today. I think our our biggest crowd yet. Uh, so we'll try to get to as many questions as we can uh, while still. Uh, keeping in the time limit. Um, you can you are free to use your uh, digital hand if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, you can also just kind of uh, signal and unmute yourself to ask a question. And I'll, uh, we have two screens of people, uh, so I'll scan the best I can uh, to get to everybody's questions. So again, you could just wave your hand and um, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question. If we have two questions at the same time, um, I'll just organize that a little bit so that everybody can get in. Um, and I do have a question coming in on the chat. So while you think of your questions, uh, Carl, there is a question from Jim asking when your four volumes with your collaborators are due out. Okay, we're at 98% on the first book. Uh, I'm finishing up photo captions right now, which is an arduous task. Uh, and we are at 75% on book two and about 60% on book three. Uh, so we're well in the way. Uh, once we get the first book out, we'll be in uh, short order with the following volumes. Uh, these will be print on demand, so they'll be readily available. Uh, there will be over 200 photographs and maps in there in the book, as well as about equal uh, amount of uh, information page wise. I have a question, Please. Carl. Um, can I give it now? Yes, I'll go ahead. Uh, Carl, did the Russians ever begin to, at any point, to appreciate uh, air reconnaissance from their um, their aviation sectors? Oh yes, yes, yes. This quickly came into play, and in 1916, uh, to jump forward, uh, General Brusilov made really good use of air reconnaissance before his uh, attack. Uh, on a tactical level, really uh, examining uh, the, uh, um, the defensive structure. Uh, and there's a lot of information in that, yes. Thank you. Um, Ch uh, Chander, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that correctly. You have a question? You're muted. Oh, I'm Oh, one more try, one more try. I can help you out if you, if, uh, you want me to. You have to unmute. Here, 
It should, there's a prompt should come up now. There you go. Oh, not quite. <laughs> I'm gonna try one more time. There should be a little prompt there to unmute yourself. Um, okay, let me, let me skip and, and yeah, let we'll me go. work with him on the chat. Um, uh, uh, let's see, let me see who's next. And while I'm doing that, um, Carl, quick question about um, the, uh, who's gonna be the publisher of your book. I know you mentioned it's print on demand. Um, what's the publisher associated with it? Uh, we're not providing that information. Oh, right okay. Now. Okay, fair enough. Um, let me scan here for some other questions. We have a question in the chat from David. He says, excellent presentation. Um, can you say something more about the Russian four engine aircraft types, uh, Ilya Muromets? That's a whole nother presentation. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you're interested, um, uh, contact Steve Sutterby. <laughs> uh -huh. No, uh, honestly, there's quite a bit written. Uh, there is there is a book that was published in the 1980s called Igor Sikorsky, The Russian Years, um, which uh, describes uh, a lot of the use of, and it's in English, uh, as opposed to a lot of Russian publications that are out there. Uh, which covers the uh, the use of the Ilya Muromets uh, during the war, uh, which was actually a reconnaissance aircraft that was also used for uh, strategic and, and tactical bombing. Uh, so it, it fulfilled three roles. It was it was unique in that sense. Wouldn't you agree, Steve? I would have said that it does strategic reconnaissance and tactical bombing. Um, there we go. They, they weren't bombing cities. They weren't bombing factories. They were bombing the, the German army. But yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Carl and Steve. Uh, Chandra, you are unmuted now, so please go ahead. Um, I was, uh, with, thank you very much for, um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for your talk, and I found it really interesting. I just wondered about um, about you. Me you mentioned a lot of uh, French planes, like Farmans and Newports. Was there any time when um, um, when like indigenous Russian planes, like Sikorsky's and such, like came came on stronger as the war progressed, or or did did the Russian air power reconnaissance air power rely mainly on French planes? So the, the big issue with uh, aircraft design in Russia was not that they did not have a good indigenous design. They made use of that, um, the Ilya Monomets uh, case in point. Right. Uh, six, uh, over 60 right. of them were built during the war period. Uh, the problem was having suitable engines. So for the Ilya Monomets, uh, it wasn't until later on in the war when the Russians uh, were able to start building a, a replica of a German engine that uh, they could uh, equip the alien motor Mets um, other than salvaged engines, which was a problem. As far as the French design, uh, the smaller aircraft, the reason they initially used those is because of the uh, the preference by the Russian military to use uh, French design, even though Russian designs proved as good as the French designs early on in the 1913 military competition. competition. Uh, Sikorsky's aircraft performed as well, as, if not better than the uh, French uh, and German designs. Uh, but was ignored. It was peculiar to the Russian uh, society. Uh, all things foreign must be better. Uh, so, but you, the exclusive realm of long range reconnaissance, uh, as Steve pointed at strategic reconnaissance, the Ilya Mormets, was unique. Uh, it was a French, uh, Russian design, and there, there was nothing else that matched it uh, in, in Russia. So, there's your answer. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the failures of the French, uh, of the Russians in the field was the fact that they used the Russian rotaries, which required uh, constant maintenance due to the use of castor oil, which clogged up the engines uh, after about 
uh, 60 hours of flight, they had to be cleaned out. And if they weren't cleaned out, you lost compression and the, you, you couldn't take off. There was that much of a, a difference in the ability to, to fly. And so you had to do that maintenance in the field. And that was a challenge in the field. Whereas the inline engines that the Germans were using at the time uh, had less maintenance requirements. They had, because they weren't using castor oil to, uh, as the rotaries were. So it's a unique situation there. Was there any attempt to, um, um, to um, import uh, engines from the Western powers? Like oh, yeah, yeah. But, get, but getting engines to Russia was a difficult task because okay. of the war. Right. And, then getting them, and then getting them from the ship, the, the, the points of, uh, you know, that the engines would arrive to the field. It, it, was, a, it was a nightmare. Right. It was a nightmare. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions? Please go ahead George. if you have a question. Uh, there we go. Um, there you go. Uh, first thing, uh, uh, Bill Trimble sends his regards from Auburn. Um, but my question would be, could you speak uh, something, just something about uh, the more productive uh, sources for your, for your work in this? You mean the, the sources for the material? Yes. Russian archives. Okay. Uh, a lot of people don't know that there's a great deal of material available uh, from the Russian archives online. Oh, I did not know that. Yep. Thank you. Um, I think we had another George who was asking a question. Uh, here, let me... Uh, Unmute you. Yep, uh, not quite. I, you could just unmute yourself. Uh, I don't see your, you're only showing up as George, so I'm not sure of your last name, sorry. You're still muted. Yes, you're still muted. Okay, let me, let me try to help him out. Um, and we'll move on to a question from the chat for the time being. Um, Scott asks, in the final slide you showed with the, uh, with the trio of uh, writers was inside an air museum. Which one? So, Carl, he's asking about your final slide that I guess was taken oh, inside uh, the air museum. Th that's that's a, uh, yes. just outside of Munich, uh, and uh, I don't want to murder the uh, name of the museum, yeah. but it's one of the uh, uh, on a Zoom a Deutsches Museum, I believe, is what it is. It's where uh, a lot of aircraft are, are kept. Um, uh, so yeah, and I also did not um, speak about, sorry, I didn't speak about that famous photo of the uh, two pilots and two observers with General Francois, uh, which is one of the few I images of German aircraft in the field in, in Prussia. I have beaten the bushes, every researcher I know looking for uh, aircraft uh, used by the Germans in East Prussia during that period of time. And I have not successfully found more than one or two, and that one was one of them, but no field photographs. The Russian, interestingly enough, there were, but uh, the Germans have not. So uh, here you go, that's, that's interesting. Thank you. And uh, George is asking how many of the uh, the, the large, the huge Sikorskis that you showed were manufactured. How many of those Sikorskis oh, over were 60 of Over 60, more than 60. But in the field, uh, when you actually look at how many were employed and used, it was, it was only a handful. And there's a whole story behind that too. It comes down to uh, a lack of engines is basically what it comes down to. I have another question if I could have one in. Okay, Carl, uh, when did the actual um, air combat occur with the German? When did that start between the Russians and the Germans? Well, 
um, as soon as uh, machine guns started getting equipped on aircraft, uh, you saw air combat coming to it. Now, uh, on the Galatian front, it was um, more time, more effort. Uh, there's the famous uh, ramming or Tehran by uh, Nesterov uh, because he knew the value of the, uh, the Austro-Hungarian aircraft's reconnaissance and what that meant. And he, he didn't intend to kill himself, but he was willing to die in the attempt. And he wrote that. And his intent was to um, put his wheels into the upper wing. But you soon saw uh, the arming of the aircraft in, in various forms. But on the Eastern Front, you see it in 1915. Uh, certainly by 1916, it's already uh, taking place uh, full force. Uh, a lot of the reconnaissance aircraft, which is what the war in the East was about, unlike uh, the war in the West, uh, the war in the East was uh, a large ranging war. And the, the front was three times the size of the Western front. And so there was a lot more uh, movement and you had to have reconnaissance, long, long reconnaissance flights to be able to keep track of what was going on. And so uh, observation planes uh, were equipped with machine guns and, and bombs for uh, opportunistic uh, use as well as uh, uh, planned uh, attacks and escorts. So you saw um, uh, Russian and uh, German uh, what would be considered a reconnaissance plane like a Voisin or a uh, <clears throat> Farman uh, being used in escort, uh, you know, armed escort for the reconnaissance airplane. So the reconnaissance airplane could do what they had to do and focus on that and the uh, other plane, which would, would be equally uh, of a reconnaissance style, not a fighter but used in a fighter role because the um, rear cockpit um, gunner had the opportunity of, of acting as a uh, <clears throat> uh, as a, as an opponent, armed opponent. So yeah, early on. Any other questions? Don't hear you. Can you not hear me? You can. Okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, so yeah, let's. Uh, if there's uh, any, uh, we have time for one more question. Let me just scan here. Any? I think I see something in the chat. Oh, Michael says very interesting talk. Thank you, Carl. I'll do one more sweep here. Okay, it looks like that's all the questions that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, so much. Thanks so much for taking the time and um, sharing all your expertise with us. Do you could, does your book uh, series have a, is there one name for all four books in the series that, that I could put on the chat so that everyone can uh, keep a lookout for that? Or is each, um, is, yeah, is there, or are all the, I know that each one has its own title. Um, but is there a, a, a an overall name for the for the four part series? Shooting the front Eastern operations. Okay, I'm going to put and, that in the chat. And for those of you who uh, may know uh, Terry Finnegan's uh, work, uh, shooting the front, uh, we borrowed from that uh, well known title, and so it's shooting the front Eastern operations. Thanks. Um, so I put that in the in the chat. A couple of people were asking if this is recorded. Uh, yes, so I, and I will have the video up on our YouTube channel uh, by the middle of next week. Um, I have that link for you. And I just, oh, I just erased it. Sorry, I had the, I had the YouTube link ready to go. Um, 
Let me just get that up for you. And Jim, while I do that, Jim, why don't you uh, talk about your presentation next month, which will be March 13th, uh, Saturday, March 13th at the same time. So Jim, you, you go ahead. You all, thank you very much, everybody. I look forward to talking to you next month. The topic is gonna to be World War I and industrial war and its implications. So we've already had a good example of how technology affected the bottle of Tannenberg. So it's gonna be a PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna compare Civil War battles to World War I, look at some of the industrial impacts between the two periods of the war, particularly rail, rail and artillery, and how that affected the conduct of the war strategically, operationally, tactically. And then I'm gonna to move to the implication of the German sabotage in America, their campaign, which was extensive. The biggest impact was the attack of Black Tom Island in New York City, which about 2 million pounds of explosives uh, were detonated with a, a huge impact. So uh, a lot to cover but I think we can move fast and I look forward to talking to everybody. Thanks, Jim. Um, and I did put the YouTube link in the chat. Um, you can also just on Google or another search engine, if you type in YouTube World War I HA, that'll come up. Um, and thank you so much, Carl. This was, this is really fascinating. Thanks everyone for, for being here. And thanks to everyone who has renewed for the uh, 2020-2021 year. Um, I'm almost finished processing all the many uh, many renewals and donations that have come in. Um, it's not too late if you want to renew for this current year and you're not sure if you did it, please just give me uh, a shout. You can contact me um, at this address. Okay, oops. There we go, it's in the chat. Um, you can also uh, access on our website. We have all of our contact information. Uh, so thank you so much, Carl. Thank you everyone. Again, uh, March 13th with Jim and we will be sending out announcements and reminders about that. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.